Hi, this is Dr. Claire, and this is our lecture on multicellularity. Um, so most living organisms that you generally see and interact with uh, on a regular basis are these multicellular organisms, and that's actually a relatively recent evolutionary development um, in life on this planet. Um, so the first uh, multicellular organisms were probably quite s simple. Um, they were probably uh, clusters or colonies of individuals that were very had very little cell differentiation, but just um, lived together in groups. Um, so you might be, well, within our lab that we're working on right now, uh, we are trying to um, select yeast to become multicellular. And so we're starting with a unicellular yeast that lives mostly by itself. And through selection, we're trying to turn it into a multicellular yeast where you have uh, a simple type of multicellularity where you have clusters of yeast that adhere to each other and kind of live together. And that's what early multicellularity was probably like, just this very simple uh, association of similar cells that live in a group close to each other um, where the genetic components of all of the cells in the group are the same, okay? So that's a, your simple uh, multicellularity. Um, multicellularity has actually evolved at least six separate times um, into complex multicellularity where you actually have cell differentiation. So it's evolved in the um, green and red algaes. Um, the green algaes are the sister group to the land plants. Um, so that's um, the plants are also in there in that group, uh, that evolutionary event. Also in the brown algae, the kelp, and then in the animals and then at least twice in the fungus group. Um, so it's actually this complex multicellularity where you have a lot of different tissue types um, is, has actually arisen multiple times. So it has some sort of fitness advantage um, for these organisms. It allows increased complexity and um, ability to utilize niches that were not available to a unicellular organism. Um, there are some issues, however, with being multicellular. Uh, if you're multicellular, you are larger. And when you're a small unicellular organism, you can rely on diffusion or the random movement of molecules to get nutrients in and out, to get gases in and out like oxygen. If you're a larger organism, it takes a while for diffusion to work across a lar larger distance because diffusion is just this random movement of molecules where they gradually move down a concentration gradient by random chance, okay? Um, if you're relying on that to get say oxygen to the middle of a large organism, it takes too long. So you have to have some sort of way to move things more quickly, okay? So uh, you get a, you're get you limited by the diffusion ability. So even simple uh, multicellular organisms like um, sponges here and jellyfish have ways to move uh, liquids more, more efficiently. So the um, some cells within the sponges have flagella that create a current that pulls water in through the holes at the side of the sponge and pushes it out the top of the sponge. And then the jellyfish has this pumping motion that it goes through as it swims along that pumps water in and out of the inside of the jellyfish and allows for um, the, the nutrients and gases to get closer to cells so that then, then diffusion can take place. But when you look at uh, more complex organisms like um, mammals, for example, or, or other vertebrates, we have a very complex circulatory system that allows us to uh, facilitate diffusion by pumping liquids throughout our body. And so we can move a very oxygen rich liquid right to the tissue and then diffusion can work to diffuse that oxygen out into the tissue and carbon dioxide in and then we can pump it away. Um, so we're not relying on it to diffuse all the way out of the body. We can use this uh, circulatory system to help facilitate that. Um, plants actually have a similar system. Um, they've got their vascular system that transports nutrients and water and uh, around the, the tissue of the plant. Um, so again, it's not relying on diffusion to slowly diffuse, like say, sugars that are made up into the leaves down to the root. That would take way too long. So they have the phloem, which takes those sugars that are produced up in the leaves and pumps it down to the root um, much more quickly. So it's a bulk, bulk transport, okay? Um, all right. Another thing is if you are multicellular, your cells have to be able to A, stick together, and B, communicate with each other. So they've got to have some way to, you know, if you're a multicellular organism, you don't want your cells to come apart, right? So things have to kind of 
stay together. Um, and, um, you know, this skin cell needs to communicate with the next skin cell over and whatever. Um, so there are structures within um, the cells of these organisms that help them to allow, to, uh, to allow them to do that. Um, in animals, we have gap junctions, an intercellular connection that's made up of a ring of proteins that helps to hold the cells together and also allow them to trans transfer um, chemical information back and forth between the cells. Um, plants have a similar mechanism called plasmodesmata. Um, plants have cell walls, um, so this is a pretty thick structure that is going to be a barrier between each cell. And so the plasmodesmata are these holes that go through the cell walls. They're lined with cell membrane, and they can allow compounds to transport back and forth between neighboring cells. Um, and uh, also they're the the endoplasmic reticulum also has little extensions that go through the plasmodesmata as well, which can allow transport of proteins and things like that. So again, holding the cells together and communicating communication between neighboring cells, very important. When you're a complex multicellular organism, you also have to have cell differentiation. So different cells do different things. You know, we've got our skin cells, we've got our blood cells, we've got our muscle cells, we've got our bone cells. Each one has a different function and they're performing different tasks but they all have the same genetic material in them. So they have to figure out some way to differentiate and um, become different from each other. So how do they know what to become? Um, and so if you look at development within these multicellular animals, there's actually triggers that start to send cells down the path to become different types of cells. So if you're looking at an animal cell, when you first have a, 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 an animal embryo, um, you, what you start out with is a ball of cells called the blastula. Already there's some signals there because there's an outer side and there's an inner side. But then you have gastrulation, which is when the, um, the cell, the one side of the ball actually folds inwards and then you have a layer of cells that are on the inside of the gastrula and the layer of cells that are on the outside. And whether you're on the inside or the outside starts to allow the cells to um, receive different environmental signals and express different proteins from each other and start to differentiate. And, and gradually that leads to this differentiation that causes um, all the different cell types to arise. Um, plants uh, are a little bit different. Um, you can look at plants. Plants have eight cells that, dif that are undifferentiated, that haven't um, um, decided, so to say, they're not actually thinking, but haven't been um, defined as a particular cell type, um, both in the root tip and the shoot tip. So that's where cell division is taking place in this area called the meristem. Um, and then um, as, this, as the meristem grows, these cells then are, as they um, age, they are either close to the surface in the middle or further in, and they start to differentiate into different types of cells. So they start to differentiate into epidermal cells or vascular cells or things like that. So, uh, but differentiation doesn't occur until they're a little bit older. So they start out being able to um, turn into any type of cell, and then as they mature, they um, become more differentiated, and then they become set in their, in their destiny, basically, and they're going to be a vascular cell for the rest of their lives, okay? Um, so multicellularity, as I said, is a re relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, the first fossils we have of relatively complex multicellular organisms are from around five to six hundred th five to six hundred million years ago. Um, so in the grand scheme of things, uh, life on this planet is about three point seven billion years old, um, and so it's only in the last half billion years or so that we have had multicell these complex multicellular organisms. So it's relatively recent. Um, and part of that was because the uh, environment really wasn't suitable for large multicellular organisms prior to that. And part of that was because there wasn't enough oxygen in the environment to support uh, a large, complex multicellular organism. They, they, um, because you have to rely, you can't rely on diffusion alone, and you have these large groups of, of cells that all need oxygen together, you have to have more oxygen in order to support that. So we had to wait. Um, until the unicellular photosynthetic things like cyanobacteria and unicellular algae um, produce enough oxygen in the atmosphere to support some of these more complex multicellular organisms. So you start to see, if you co correlate, this is oxygen levels in the atmosphere here. So if you look at, this is where you started to get a lot of photosynthetic um, prokaryotes, 
um, and then a burst of photosynthetic eukaryotes. And here is where you finally reach an oxygen level where um, complex multicellular organisms can actually be supported. So um, it, there's a certain amount of oxygen that's necessary before that's going to happen. Um, also, multicellular organisms um, have uh, moved onto land, as you probably noticed. Um, and again, that's a, uh, something that's rec that needs a certain amount of oxygen for um, that to occur. Um, and part of the reason that that happened is because um, at what, okay, so when you're living in the water, you're protected from UV light that's coming down from through the atmosphere and striking the planet. UV light is bad because it causes mutations. Most mutations are bad, so if you get exposed to too much UV light, it can cause you to die. It's bad. Um, but as the photosynthetic organisms on this planet produce more and more oxygen, um, that oxygen got up into the upper atmosphere, and when it's struck by light, some of it turns into ozone, which is uh, three oxygen atoms instead of only two. And ozone absorbs UV light and protects the surface of the planet. So once we got to a certain oxygen level where an ozone layer could form, that allowed um, uh, more protection from UV light and allowed organisms to move up onto land. And so that's when we had the uh, colonization of land, for, first by um, plants and then later by animals and leads to the terrestrial ecosystems that we see today. Um, so that's my lecture on multicellularity. Catch you next time.